Great, thank you for joining our webinar in conjunction with Shield Safety Group today. Um, I'm Ellie and I'm working, I work in the BI's marketing department. Um, so I'm shortly going to hand over to Talas and Rob, who will be hosting the webinar. Um, and the theme for today's session is Allergens and Natasha's Law. Um, so this will act as a training to help prepare licensees and staff members alike. Um, and if I could ask you to keep your cameras and your um, microphones turned off for now, what we'll do is um, you can submit questions via the chat box. Um, and that there will, um, so you can do that throughout the session and our team will um, try and get around to answer as many as possible. Um, so as many as allows at the end of the session. So I'm going to now um, hand over to Rob, who will start the webinar. Perfect. Thank you, Ellie. I'm just aware we've got six people have entered the room, so we'll let those in. Um, and just as I share my screen. So, Talos, perhaps can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen share? Yeah, okay? everything's fine. Yes, Rob. Amazing. Thank you. Here we go. There we go. So for those that have just joined us, um, Ellie has just said sort of normal uh, protocol around Zoom, if we can turn our mics and cameras off. Um, and what we'll be doing is if we can enter questions into the chat box and then Ellie and, uh, and the team from BII can uh, can work through those. Um, so many thanks for the, um, the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Rob Easton, Head of Consultancy at Shield Safety Group. Um, and what I'm going to concentrate on today is around uh, PPDS food, obviously Natasha's Law, uh, shortly on the 1st of October, but actually looking um, at the general management of allergens. One, one of my concerns is there's great focus on PPDS uh, and a lot of focus around the labelling and the provision of information to consumers. Um, but actually, there are elements of allergen management, allergen control that we need to get right um, before we think about the labelling. So uh, that's why my presentation is called Common Failure Points for Allergens and what to do about them, obviously with regard to PPDS. And then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Tadas, uh, who's going to talk about training and training a team. I think what we agree, Tadas, is we will hold questions at, until the end. Um, because uh, I, I may present and um, and then only for Tadis to give a perfect answer in his presentation that follows me. So what we're going to cover off today is a quick introduction to Shield Safety for those of you that don't know us. Um, uh, what is PPDS? Again, just so we've got clarity and a common understanding of what prepackaged for direct sale means. And then I'm going to introduce the food value creation chain. So this is looking about how menus are developed, created, and foods are delivered to consumers, and then looking at the common failure points along the food value creation chain, um, and then some solutions. So that's uh, that's the cunning plan. So introduce Shield Safety Group. So uh, for those that you don't know us, Shield Safety Group uh, have been trading since 2003, and we predominantly work in the uh, hospitality and retail including pubs, hotels, restaurants, but also supermarkets, retailers, golf courses we're doing a lot of work with at the moment. And we're there to support with their food safety, health and safety and fire safety needs. We're the largest employer of environmental health practitioners in the UK. Um, we've got teams up and down the country auditing uh, and checking for safety standards. Um, what we work to here is to the right hand side is our uh, cycle of continuous improvement. And this is how we support businesses to improve their safety performance and culture, be that writing policies and risk assessments, training them in those policies, support from our safety advice line, which I know members of the BII have uh, free access to as part of your membership, checks and monitoring, be that through our paper diaries or the monitoring module on our compliance centre, fire risk assessments we also support with, and then auditing. And then because it's a continuous cycle of improvement, learning from those audits, then we can go back and review the policies, risks, assessments, uh, and we look to make it better and better uh, each time we interact with our clients. And then some of our key partnerships there on the left-hand side, um, we're very proud to work with Milton Keynes Council, who we have primary authority advice with. Um, and that means that uh, a short advice for our food safety and health and safety systems and also working very closely with the Food Standards Agency and Food Standards Scotland and looking at the future regulatory framework. Um, so that's a little bit about shield safety. Um, let's crack on with PPDS. Can you still see the slide OK, Tadas? Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. Perfect. Yeah, great. That was a chance for a little sip of my coffee as well. Um, so I'm very mindful today and, and you know, I've, uh, we've done a couple of these presentations before and indeed attended some ourselves um, and they can get slightly bogged down into questions around, well, is this PPDS? Is this not PPDS? And it's not my intention today really to, to field those sorts of questions. If you do have them, then uh, for uh, members of the BII, please, you can call the safety advice line, uh, Shield Safety that you have access to and they can go through the intricate details. 
um, I, I'd rather talk around the general requirements of PPDS than getting into the individual circumstances. So what is PPDS? Well, we know that's a prepackaged for direct sale. And we've got this nice, simple flow diagram on the right hand side, which if you've spent any time recently looking at prepackaged for direct sale, you'll be familiar with this. So it simply is the food presented to the customer in packaging. No, well, it's not prepackaged because it's not in packaging. Um, if we go on to yes, the next one is, is it packaged before the customer selects or orders it? Um, if it's not, then it's not prepackaged, the prepackaged being the important part there. Um, if it is packaged before the customer selects it, uh, is it packaged at the same place it is sold? And the reason we're interested there is uh, if it's uh, not prepackaged at the same place it's sold, then it's uh, packaged food and the labelling requirements existed previously anyhow. And then if you can answer yes to all three of those examples, then the food will require PPDS labelling. And then again, when we actually look at the definition of packaging, that's around, does it uh, wholly or partially enclose the food? And in uh, accessing the food, does that packaging uh, become damaged? So, like I say, um, I've heard lots of questions of people saying, well, is this PPDS? Is this not PPDS? What I say every time is it's pretty good. If you go back to this flow diagram, you should be able to answer the question uh, yourself. And then if you're looking at individual packaging, you know, if it's uh, served on a tray, for example, I know is one of the examples that's given like a hot dog or a burger, that's not pre-packaged for direct sale because the packaging isn't altered when accessing the food. So like I say, if you've got questions about is it or is it not PPDS, this is a really good place to start and should be able to answer, I would say, most, most questions. A couple of examples that we give there is uh, sandwiches packaged by the food business or sold or offered from the same premises. Yeah, that would absolutely be PPDS. Fast food, which is wrapped or packaged before the customer selects or orders it. And again, the important and the reason I've used that example there is it's about the wrapping before the consumer orders it. It's the pre-packaged uh, part of the definition. And then one I've included here, hampers containing wrapped food that is made and wrapped prior to the guest ordering. Uh, just aware of the uh, audience we have here for pubs, hotels, you may be doing takeaway hampers for guests to, to eat out in the pub beer garden or on the lawn. Yeah, the key part there is if the food is wrapped prior to the consumer, to the guest ordering it. Um, and examples that are not, again, those items that are loose, why? Because they're not packaged, uh, pre-packed food, packaged at a different premises. Again, that's the definition. It would have uh, been required the labeling anyhow. Um, food packaged at the customer's request. I imagine we'll get a couple of examples like that in pubs and restaurants, uh, whereby they've asked for it to be put into a, a bag and that happens after the transaction. And distance selling. So for those of you that do takeaway services, um, uh, delivery or, or the like, um, there's already rules around the distance selling of goods that require the communication of allergens. So those items, the, the, the takeaways, the distance selling, um, the information has to be given at the point of ordering and also at the point of delivery. It's already covered in the legislation. So I thought I'd just include that bit in PPDS. Like I say, it's always good to go back to the flow diagram. Maybe there'll be some questions after Tadis has finished his presentation. So what I'd like to do now is talk around more sort of general allergen management. And this is the control of allergens, um, regardless if it's for PPDS or just general consumption by the consumer. So the food value chain. Um, this is a bit of work that we've created to identify how value is added in the production of food. Uh, and it looks at the steps right through, you'll see here from dish design and specification, all the way to delivery of food and drinks to the customer. I must say that this is a, a slightly simplified version of our uh, food value chain for this presentation, because it was about twice the length and it didn't fit on the slide. Um, but it just uh, hopefully gives you an overview. What we do is we've looked at the steps uh, in creating a menu uh, and then building that menu and then uh, supplier, uh, sourcing suppliers, creating the dish in house, serving it to the consumer can, and then communicating to the consumer. What we've uh, been able to do um, is because we are such a, a large presence of environmental health practitioners, we are supporting clients all the time, investigating incidents of uh, allergens, uh, of, of cases of illness, and also from the audit data that uh, we have from auditing up and down the country what we've been able to do is against this food value chain is map the common places where things go wrong with with allergen management and uh, when we're able to map where things go wrong obviously we can then look at solutions so what I'm going to share with you now just for the next couple of minutes are the most common places that we've found failures in allergen management and uh, like I say a couple of hopeful solutions that stops it happening to you. So the first one I'm going to look at is um, right at the beginning, dish design and specification. 
And, and what we're interested in here is um, some of you may be familiar with health and safety. We talk about the hierarchy of controls, the ability to manage the risk early on and manage that risk out of the um, out of the situation. Because if, if the risk doesn't exist at all, then you don't need to think about further controls down the line, like training, like communication, uh, like administrative controls. And we apply that principle to food safety as well. That, you know, can we manage the hazard out early on so it doesn't become a problem? Uh, and what we're interested in here is introducing new allergens into the kitchen. And again, in previous roles that I've had and supporting clients, when we're looking at dish design, is one dish can introduce an allergen that wasn't previously there. You know, so, for example, it may be um, uh, sesames that are used in a, uh, a, a coating for a deep fried product. Um, actually, if they're not sesame seeds anywhere else in the kitchen, if it's just one product amongst many, and what we'd be saying is, do you really need to introduce that allergen because it suddenly increase, increases the risk burden into the food operation? So look carefully at menu design to see if allergens are going to be introduced that weren't previously there and see if, you can be, if they can be substituted, you know, another product used. So we'd, we'd be saying design allergens out where you can. Another great example is um, mayonnaise. So where you can get a vegan mayonnaise that won't have the eggs in it. Actually, it's a great product. Um, it, no one will tell the difference, but what you've done straight away is reduce the allergens coming into the kitchen, reduce the controls that are required on the kitchen team. Um, and also in doing so, it increases the availability, the choice that is there for allergen sufferers. So go right to the very beginning. Don't try and manage allergens at the, at the back end. Um, you can take steps early on to re reduce the risk burden going into your business. So that's the first one, dish design and specification. Next one I'm going to concentrate on is allergen identification and communication. Now, of course, this is absolutely critical for PPDS because you're going to be putting that information onto the label. It's going to be communicated to the consumer in that way. But it's just as important for food that is, is offered um, over the bar, your, your normal requirements as you have now for managing allergens. And what we find working with clients when we're doing site visits, when we're doing investigations, is there is a terrifying a level of incorrect identification of allergens. You know, this is in the allergen matrix, and this may be that they haven't identified the allergen correctly from the recipe, from the ingredients going into it, or that uh, out-of-date communication. So as menu changes, the allergen matrix isn't changed to recognize the new, new dishes. Now this causes a real problem. Like I say, this causes a problem for allergens that are communicated for matrix, but it's the same for PPDS is it doesn't matter how good you do everything else after this, how good your team training is, how good the communication is with the kitchen. If that information is fundamentally wrong, the consumer is making a decision, the guest is making a decision on information that's inaccurate. Um, and what we would say, it's absolutely key that the information that you have going onto the labels, the information that's going into your algae matrix is correct and up to date. So how do you do that? Well, you look at an independent review of your allergen matrix, so a fresh pair of eyes um, to see where there's been, uh, there's been errors. And we've seen it recently whereby uh, one dish between a main and a side order, uh, it's exactly the same dish. Uh, one listed uh, a number of allergens and the main um, listed none. And all what it was in transferring the allergen matrix information over, they forgot to transfer the allergen information. So an independent review of the allergen matrix, a fresh pair of eyes, and then document control is really important to make sure that the uh, allergen matrix, the recipe cards, the information that the kitchen is using relates to the current menu. Um, and again, if you think about the consumer, if you just hand them a whole load of information, you know, three years worth of menus to go through, then they're bombarded with info. It's about as much as is necessary, not as much as, as possible. So really just provide the allergen information for the dishes, the menu that's being served at that time. So real focus on allergen matrix uh, and allergen identification. Like I say, it is um, it's terrifying how often it is wrong. So that independent view and also get your chefs and your kitchen team, you know, that they're period periodically checking that they're checking that the menu um, as is being um, communicated to the guest is for the current allergen matrix. Then the final one that I just want to talk about um, is looking at stock outs and substitutions. And the reason that we put this on is obviously this is a real hot topic. We know that the issues with uh, HGV drivers, we know that the supply chain is being massively impacted into hospitality and retail. So the likelihood of stock outs and substitutions uh, is greater than ever. And of course, the real hazard here um, is that uh, we have an allergen matrix. We have the allergen labeling for a uh, product uh, pre-packaged for direct sale and the SKU, the ingredient is amended. And therefore that allergen information becomes invalid. 
this absolutely does happen. So one of the controls we can look at is only allow substitutions of simple ingredients. So what do I mean by that? It's the primary goods, it's the meat, it's, it's the single, it's flour, it's cheese. Um, don't allow substitutions of compound ingredients, those with a number of ingredients that make up the product. You know, a common one that is cited is chips. You know, a chip is not a chip, unfortunately. If it's substituted with a chip that's got a gluten coating on it, then that will become an issue for an allergen sufferer. So it only allows substitutions of simple ingredients. The next one is agree secondary SKUs or ingredients with your suppliers. So if a tomato sauce does need to be replaced, um, you know the one that it's going to be replaced with and it's got the same allergens or indeed less allergens in it. Um, ultimately, do not sell the dish. Um, one of the, the things we have in hospitality is this absolute need to have absolutely on the menu, absolutely everything all the time. And do you know what? It's OK to sell out. Uh, it's OK to say, no, I'm afraid that dish isn't available today because the controls and the action that you take to try and get it back on actually may not be safe to do so. So there is that ultimate to say, actually, I'm afraid we're sold out of that dish today. And then what I would say, one to look at if you're a manager, um, a general manager, a regional manager or a central manager is look at petty cash um, expenditure. So what we know is supply chains controlled centrally are, are very good. You can control the SKUs that are going into the premises, into the business. But then as soon as there's petty cash expenditure at, at a local level, what that allows for is, well, it opens up the supply chain. So what I'd be recommending is always check that petty cash expenditure by the chef to see what's being bought out outside um, of the supply chain. And one other that I would add on stockouts and substitutions, and which is particularly important around PPDS, is we know that there's a lot of technical solutions around labeling machines. Yeah, we know that that's a great answer whereby you can enter your allergen information into a matrix. It prints the labels, they can be affixed to the, um, the, the goods. Now think around, that's a single point of failure. If, you're, if your labeling solution stops working, if your labels run out, if your inks run out, yeah, that's critical, um, absolutely central to your business. So what, are the, what is the crisis management? What is the steps that you can take to overcome that? Are you able to write handwritten labels? Now, obviously that creates its own problems because the tech size is, uh, has to, is uh, predefined, the need to bold or highlight uh, allergens within the, the dish. So just have a think if, if you are investing in this technology and yeah, it, it is absolutely fantastic technology. It gives a great answer to managing PPDS, but what happens if that fails? And ultimately, you know, it, it's the same control as do not sell the dish, um, which could have a massive impact on your business. And that means about having those secondary controls in place, the what if, if your labeling machine fails, what, what is your answer? What are you going to do about it? Uh, and there we go. Uh, what we have, that really was, a, like I say, it was a, it was a brief overview of the um, food value chain where we see it goes wrong most common and then the controls you can put in place. What we've produced is our um, guide and checklist for food allergen safety. What we've got in there is um, five key things to consider, thinking a bit wider, obviously covering off the three that I've spoken about this morning, but also a checklist to use in your business um, that you can go through, answer yes or no. If it identifies as a no, it would suggest that further work is required uh, around the management of allergens and also prepackaged for direct sale food. So the um, checklist there, it's available for download. Ellie, I also believe that this is being sent out to BII members as well um, after this uh, presentation. And I'd encourage you, this is being developed by our team of environmental health practitioners, by our safety consultants, uh, and it's very much there, free for you to download because we want to help your business and support your business. Now, um, what I'll do at that point is I'm going to hand over to Tadis uh, and then we'll take uh, any questions at the end, if that's OK. Tadis, are you OK to, to fly the slides now? Yes, thank you very much, Rob. Thank Perfect. you, Ali, for inviting me to present to this webinar. So let me just share uh, my screen. Okay, just a second. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to see my screen now. Just give me a thumbs up. Okay, it looks like I may have lost you. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Rob, are you there? Forgive me, Talis, not yet. I can just, uh, yep, no, we've got your screen. There we go. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. So my name is Talis, head, um, head of training at Shield Safety. Um, I've been invited to present and to talk a little bit about allergen training and how to develop effective training that actually works. Obviously, as we know, um, Natasha's law is just around the corner, only a few days left. 
So hopefully uh, many of you already done a lot of preparation and hopefully you're already there. So I just wanted to talk about the effectiveness of training because the important part of training is to make sure that people take things in and they're ready to go out there and serve the clients and customers and they are able to answer any questions to do with allergens. So just to give you a bit of a background about myself. So um, I've been working in food industry for the past 18 years, mainly working for large food manufacturing companies in various roles, um, ranging from food production, quality and technical, and of course, learning and development. So over the years, I've actually been in, uh, involved in variety, uh, variety of aspects of allergen management. Uh, which also includes, for example, raw material specification reviews to do with allergens, hygiene and cross-contamination controls. I was also part of the allergen management team to develop allergen risk assessments in food manufacturing sites. And of course, learning and development and training people in allergen management. So today I would like to talk about the importance of having the effective um, allergen training strategy, which can help your business to succeed following the legal changes, which are due to come into force as of 1st of October. Okay, so many of you will be very familiar with the term training community threat to your work activities. So this is the phrase which have been pulled out from the food safety legislation. So quite commonly, this term is quite vague and quite unclear, but the most important thing is that it can also sometimes be misinterpreted. So the very important part to do with allergen and Natasha's law training is to make sure that people are sufficiently trained and they have that right level of knowledge, like I said, to go out and serve your customers. So, so that impact allergen training has on the business and legal changes has massive impact on your business. So that's why it's important to make sure that your staff is sufficiently trained. So, for example, for people who don't have food allergies, to go out and have a meal at the restaurant is quite a straightforward thing. But, for example, if anybody who has um, some sort of hypersensitivity to food, it becomes a massive challenge to put that trust into people who has, um, you know, who has been providing that meal. So that is why to make sure that your business is providing food, which, as it says on the menu, is um, vital and important than ever before. So hospitality challenges and training, it does have a very, very close relationship. So what I wanted to talk about on this slide is the current challenges that your businesses are gonna be facing uh, to ensure that you can still be operating. And I'm gonna start with the staff shortage. That's probably one of the very painful subjects for many, many of your businesses. Uh, and just wanted to give you some facts. So prior to pandemic, hospitality was employing around 3.2 million people. And it was the third largest employer in the whole of the UK labor market. So that makes a huge chunk of the whole people, of, of the total people that would be employed in the whole of the UK. So some sources suggest that one in 10 hospitality roles are vacant, which also suggests the shortage of more than 180,000 uh, workers, and this has been published by the Trade Association UK Hospitality. So many companies are no longer just focusing on recruitment. Staff retention becomes more important than ever before. It's making sure that whatever you provide within your business will keep those people and they're still going to be willing to continue working for your business. So it's estimated it takes around 28 weeks for somebody new who starts within your business to be fully up to speed within their job roles. Obviously, this is just a guidance, guidance and it will vary depending on the job that they would be employed to do. The next one would be COVID controls. So around 68% of hospitality business owners have had to temporarily uh, close their businesses during the pandemic. And unfortunately, only 20%, sorry, 27% have been eligible for furlough. So in addition, businesses like yours uh, were having to look at reducing the amount of customers that you're going to be letting into your premises. Uh, there, there would have been additional expenditure on other COVID controls, which have also had a major impact on your profits. The next one is cash, cash flow and profitability. Around 45% um, have been earning less money despite any government grants. 
and it's estimated on average around 40,000 um, 40, was lost in profits over the pandemic. So this was obviously across the board, you know, ranging from large to small catering and hospitality businesses. So many businesses had to learn different ways and new ways how to manage uh, manage the income and 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 uh, profits that you were making. So many businesses were started looking at um, you know how to control the menus, um, tackle food waste as an example, and of course optimizing staff. So one of the biggest costs to any hospitality hospitality business would be labor. So it's absolutely crucial for any business to make sure that you have the right amount of staff the right amount of people. And if you don't have enough people, that means your customer service will be suffering. The next one I wanted to cover is the business continuity. So during the pandemic, hospitality industry as a whole have proven to be very resilient to, um, to the way that we, uh, our customers have been served. Um, and any, any businesses which will survive um, such difficult times certainly will be coming out stronger than ever before. And the final one, which is training time and cost. Now, unfortunately, um, many businesses seem to think that training is always, um, is always that kind of thing that could be done tomorrow. Now, it doesn't always actually work like that, especially if we have legal changes just around the corner. So uh, we had a major, you know, major increase in in bookings to do with allergens, um, because even, you know, even to the last week before the actual legal changes, we have seen businesses still some way chasing the tail and trying to get their staff trained, um, you know, to allergen changes. So on this next part, I would like to talk about how to make sure allergen training is effective when there's little time left. So we have a variety of different training methods which can be utilized by your businesses to make sure that that training is taking place. And I would like to start with the standard operating procedures. So standard operating procedures would be the quickest solution for the business to make sure um, that allergen specific aspects are actually covered and you can train your staff in what you actually do within the business to do with allergen management. SOP training is usually, uh, usually easily uh, maintained and developed. It can actually be developed by an in-house um, experts or people who has more knowledge uh, in allergen management. And um, yeah, training will be specific to a department or a job, job role. And one of the best ones I've actually seen in my experience um, standard operating procedures to be made as uh, pictorials. So using, using more pictures, especially this is very useful if you have any members of the staff whose English is not the first language. Um, and in addition to that, um, in addition to that, people do like to see things rather than sometimes just reading through. Now, the following, the following method of learning would be e-learning. So the um, benefit of e-learning that it is quite convenient. You can get your staff trained by enrolling them and possibly, you know, catching up on e-learning modules, even outside of work. Um, and what it does basically, it provides a, a bit of a background knowledge in why we actually manage an allergens within the business. Now, unfortunately, there's some downsides to do with e-learning. So not everybody will embrace such learning. Um, sometimes the quality of the uh, e-learning can also um, have a major impact on how people are actually learning as well. So you should really be very careful, you know, how you select and who you select as your e-learning provider, because um, the, the training programs to do with allergen training should really be designed with the learner in mind. Okay, so the next one would be remote virtual training. So that type of training would be when the trainer would be uh, delivering the training via Microsoft Teams or Zoom application. So it's essentially trying to mimic, trying to mimic the, um, the classroom training. And by um, using such training, you have a better chance that people hopefully will will take things in slightly better. They get the opportunity to actually ask tutor questions 
And during that time, you can also utilize tutor experience. Uh, there would be some interaction. Um, the training programs are generally structured, classroom-like classroom -like type of training. And it can be very useful for multi-site businesses if you don't want to have too much expenditure for your members of the team to actually travel to one location. It can actually be very handy to actually get them to join um, Microsoft Teams or Zoom uh, training course. Um, the only downside I could think of would be the broadband issue. So as we know, the technology sometimes can let us down and unfortunately sometimes it can um, you know, it can have an, an impact um, on attendance. And last but not least would be good old classroom training. So obviously during the pandemic, many of the training providers have actually had to learn um, to learn different, you know, to deliver training different ways. So that's where the remote training have, have, have started a massive, um, massive increase. But classroom training, so again, you could utilize tutor there and then uh, you can ask questions and um, yeah, it, it will also accommodate different learning styles. So the knowledge retention hopefully should be far much greater compared to all the previous, uh, previous ones. Uh, the only downside I could think of would be releasing staff to attend and especially again, going back to multi-site businesses, releasing traveling, potentially accommodation cost. Um, so there would be slightly uh, greater expenditure. So as a business, you should really be looking at the training solutions and how do you plan your um, long-term strategy. So in this slide, I wanted to suggest the way you could prioritize your training, and in particular, when it comes down to Allergen and Natasha's law training. So you should be really, um, you should consider developing and revising your existing Allergen standard operating procedures. So I'm sure you will probably have something already in place, but it's just a case of actually um, making sure that your standard operating procedures are fit for purpose. And also it's consistent, it provides the consistency to your staff, and it could be delivered by, uh, trained by anyone from within your business. So if you think about the hospitality sector, I'd like to share some facts with you. So um, the sector is absolutely crucial providing um, accessible and flexible jobs um, when it comes down to entry level jobs. So around 35% of all the workforce within the hospitality industry would be uh, 20, aged 24 or under. So the sector is often described as providing the nation's, fav nation's favorite and best first job. However, this accessibility to entry work has fed to a sector's reputation, which is known as the low skilled labor. And there was a big a difference um, in terms of the pay as a comparison uh, to be, uh, which has been reviewed back in 2020. So on average, um, just over eight pounds on average, uh, an hourly rate had been paid in hospitality industry as the medium across the industry was um, over 13 pounds. So sometimes it, make, it is making it very difficult to actually to attract people um, to join the hospitality business. Luckily, the government have actually announced um, earlier this year that they'll be investing two and a half billion uh, in the National Skills Fund, and hopefully National Skills Fund will help businesses to actually to, to look at ways of actually retaining staff and training staff. So as a business, you should really be looking at um, other areas, how you can actually maintain your workforce within your business. So looking at, for example, apprenticeships, um, also considering career development path for existing employees and also training and development opportunities, not only to attract new talent, but also retain your existent. So going back to the slide. So again, um, e-learning would be the next layer in terms of the priority. So like I said, this would be providing the reasons why um, your staff will have to follow, follow those standard operating procedures. And then, of course, long, longer term, you can then start looking at either remote virtual training and classroom training, which will further enshrine, um, you know, the, the allergen knowledge into your employees' memory. Uh, I also wanted to talk about uh, training needs analysis. And I'd like to share some tips how you can carry out allergen training needs analysis in a rational way. So as our slogan suggests, making safety simple, the compliance training should really be fitting within those brackets as well. 
So if you follow those guidelines, hopefully you should be able to develop a simplified training needs analysis and see where you are as a business in terms of the allergen training. So the first one is listing job roles. You will have direct impact, who will have direct impact on allergen management within your business. So if you have not done much work yet, hopefully you did. Um, you list roles who would be responsible to manage allergens. So these could be, for example, chefs, restaurant managers. The next one would be looking at the training programs, which should be in place to ensure their knowledge is up to date and they know what falls within their responsibility. So, for example, restaurant manager to develop allergen communication on menus or website, chef to develop allergen uh, matrix um, and assess basically the suitability. Then after that, um, you carry out a gap analysis and check um, what has already been done and what you already have in place. So have you trained your front of house in allergen standard operating procedures? Has your shop completed either e-learning or classroom um, training on allergens? Uh, what you then do, so then you plan the training for those um, who would basically, who wouldn't have received that training. So even if you book your staff to complete e-learning or classroom, the very important part to bear in mind is to make sure how much knowledge have they actually brought back with them. So having some sort of um, assessment, um, assessment process in place, just checking, you know, a simple questionnaire just to make sure that they are, um, you know, up to speed with, with the allergen and legal changes. And finally, not to forget refresher training. So refresher training is very important, especially when it comes down to certain types of qualifications. So for example, first aid, um, there's a legal requirement that you have to refresh your qualification, otherwise it's no longer valid. Now, it's not the case when it comes down to allergens, but to keep the momentum and just to keep that knowledge still fresh, um, you know, it's always recommended to refresh uh, your allergen every three years. I just wanted to stress out a little bit the importance of the uh, allergen standard operating procedures and um, training. So it is um, a useful and in-house and consistent process breakdown used to tra for training purposes. So if you use your standard operating procedures, this could be a very good starting point for you to make sure that knowledge is passed on across the, across the business. It, uh, as already mentioned previously, it also enables the experienced staff to pass that knowledge to, uh, for example, new starters. Um, we know that the staff turnover is, is very, very uh, common thing in hospitality at the moment. Um, it provides access to staff to, for reference. So having those SOPs somewhere available within the kitchen or within the office, so staff could actually go back and refer back to um, the standard operating procedure if they need to. Um, it's, it's also advisable to have it for reference. Um, also ensures the key allergen risk areas are better maintained, including hand washing or work surface cleaning, ingredient segregation and labeling. And also it does provide your training consistency within your business. And I came across this, um, this quote some time ago. So tell me and I forget, teach me and I'll remember and involve me and I'll learn. So this has been um, said by Benjamin Franklin. So hopefully, you know, by following the standard operating procedures, following the tips that I've shared with you previously um, will help you to enshrine that allergen knowledge within your business. Okay, so what sort of solutions do we offer as a, as a business uh, to your businesses, uh, you know, if needs be? So if you're still falling slightly behind with your training, allergen training, uh, more than welcome to contact us. So uh, we do provide e-learning, um, e-learning packages to do with allergen and Natasha's law. And that type of training is, is quite uh, good actually for general population within your business, essentially. We also offer half day allergen awareness for, for catering. Uh, half day either tutor led remote training course or classroom based course could be delivered at your premises. And again, this is more for general population across your businesses. And we also offer one um, full day uh, training course, uh, which is called allergen training for management. And that, that type of training is more suitable for the likes of chefs, restaurant managers, um, and so on and so forth. So essentially for people who are responsible to manage allergens within, within the business. Okay, so that's all I wanted to cover. Um, 
And I will now be opening, um, or we will now be opening for questions. Rob? Yeah, hello there, Tadis. Thank you. So we're happy if we're, uh, to take questions in the chat. I know Eddie's keeping an eye on that as well. So um, thank you for the presentation, Tadis. Is there anything um, from either section uh, that you've heard this morning that you'd like to query or question or perhaps seek some further information on? It's a quiet, a quiet group. I know it's Monday morning. They're probably thinking about stock counts and recovering from the weekend. Any questions? Ellie, I'll open it to you. Is there anything? Um, yeah, I suppose one of the questions I'd like to ask is with, with just a couple of days to go um, for those people on the call, how are, you, how are you feeling? How confident are you? Do you think you've got things in place? And think from the presentation this morning that um, has made you rethink. So it's interesting. We've obviously got uh, people from different backgrounds, different parts of the industry here. Um, how are you feeling about it? Is anyone uh, willing to put their hand up and, <laughs> and say where they are with, with it just around the corner? Sorry, that was rather cruel of me putting others on the, on the spot. So I'm happy if people want to turn their mics on or turn their, their video on if they want to give a, a, an insight into how they're doing. No. <laughs> Sorry, oh. um, Ellie, are you there? I'm just having slight um, yes, issues, yeah. slight issues with Zoom. I'm not very used to Zoom. How do I get back to a normal screen uh, on the Zoom? Um, I so apologize. If you stop sharing, it should come up at the top um, as a red button. I do apologize. It's just all I have these little dots, and um, yeah, you, you, let's crack on. I'll uh, I'll figure it out. Um, Is there anything that you tend to usually get as a common question from people um, when it comes to allergens, maybe in, in your training sessions or anything like that? So I think um, I think like um, like any legal changes, um, you know, many businesses are a little bit uncertain, you know, until that law actually changes, you know, in terms of the confidence that their staff is actually trained. I think um, just to reiterate what I was talking about, the standard operating procedures, and making sure that these are actually in place. Um, you know, how do you develop, um, you know, allergen standard operating procedures? Um, certainly, you know, it's something that business has to take the ownership, but we are here to help, you know, if anyone needs any assistance to do with the SOP development, you know, we're more than help, uh, you know, more than happy to, to help you out with. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, uh, it's making sure that these key training programs are actually live and they're used within the business to make sure that staff are actually up to speed with the allergen um, legal changes. And I think just adding to, to Tadas, I think um, it's about don't concentrate on the end. Um, it's the steps that you can take prior to that. So looking at that value creation chain or whatever you, you wish to call it, but looking at how menus are developed, um, suppliers are sourced, how they're chosen, how um, information is gathered. If you just try and uh, manage it at the, the last step, which is the communication with the guest, it, it will go wrong. You know, all of those prerequisites uh, need to be in place. And I just urge anyone on this call to look at their business in its entirety, right through from when you're designing the menu um, to the point of delivery. We, we tend to, to focus on the last step, but think of all the others in there. So, uh, and we're not going to get anyone on, are we? No one's going to <laughs> to share how they're feeling. I understand it, it's, it's Monday morning. So um, Ellie, we're quite happy if there's no further questions, I'm just gonna chat, uh, check the chat. Um, we're, we're happy to wrap it up from our end if you are. Yeah, so just to round off, um, so you've, you've put together a really brilliant checklist that's available to all attendees. Um, so we'll be sending that out to, um, to everyone at, via the emails that you've submitted to, to sign up. So that'll be a really good resource for you to use after the webinar itself. And thank you so much to Rob and Tadas. That's been really informative. And I'm sure there's a lot of bits that everyone's going to be ha having in their heads to then action in their businesses and, and work forward with Natasha's law coming into play. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Can I ask a question? Oh. Oh. Yes. Question. Uh, 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 oh, well, and John sneaking one in there. Go on then. <laughs> no, 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 no. A quick one, a very quick one. I, I, don't, I don't know if you. Uh, um, we're we're very new in the business, and so all of this is new stuff to us, um, pub business, and uh, um, we're just running to catch up with all these regulations and procedures. The 
um, as an ex-military person, SOP is is the mainframe of um, uh, operations. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a, you know, a thing that's very important about SOPs is that they're very simple and they're very mm-hmm. easy to follow and maintain. Yep. Um, is, so I suppose it's a very dull, basic question, but is there a standard SOP for uh, for us all to refer to? Um, I think um, in terms of the actual format, I mean, I've seen mm. various different formats um, over the years, you know, how um, how business wants to, you know, how to, you know, to present it on the paper. Um, my personal preference when it comes down to um, to standard operating procedures is trying to make it simple, like you mentioned, yeah. and trying to make it pictorial because, um, the, you know, the, the industry where I used to work in the past, you know, food manufacturing, you know, there used to be very highly, um, you know, foreign nationals with English not being the first language. It used to be a very, very effective way of actually putting that message across and people were just able to actually... Um, to you know to take it on board you know what's been asked and how to follow that particular standard operating procedure um i i certainly uh, i'm a great fan of you know using pictorials you know a step by step guide how do you mm-hmm. carry out how do you carry out um, um task or activity and just having you know a picture um pictures to support this i think it has far much greater effect compared to a written standard procedure where you have loads of text and like yeah. I said, you know, sometimes the language can become a, a, a bit of a, a bit of an obstacle. It, it depends, obviously, you know, what, what sort of workforce do you have within your business? But essentially, it just kind of includes that visual, uh, visual way of learning as well. And hopefully people would be able to remember better. But not to forget to have those standard operating procedures accessible somewhere within the business. So people can always refer back if needs be. You know, so they don't have to chase the restaurant manager, you know, just to find out what should they should be doing to do with, I don't know, let's say allergen um, labeling, for example, within the kitchen, as an example. So hopefully that that kind of answers your question. I suppose I'm looking for the best example of what that might look I'll, like. <laughs> John, right. I'll, I'll, I'll help you. I'll help there if I can, John. So if, um, you know, it's uh, many of the clients that we support are very similar to yourself, John, um, mm-hmm. you know, coming to yeah. us to the, to the first time into hospitality and suddenly you're presented with this whole range of laws and interpretations and, and it's not stag- uh, static, it changes. Now, there is good information that is available through the Food Standards Agency. Um, however, um, you know, what we do at Shield is take that. Many of us are ex-operators ourselves. So, you know, within the leadership team, within the senior management, we're not just EHPs. We're people that have run pubs, have run businesses and, and cut our teeth there as well as being local authority enforcement. So we're very aware what we try and do is take that 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 uh, base information and interpret it in such a way that it can be used by operators. So we, we're almost the translator, if you like. <laughs> um, so, so what I'd do is, yeah. you know, we'd, we'd be very happy to give you a bell um, or if you contact us at Shield Safety and we'll talk through how we support uh, hospitality and retail businesses and, and particularly those that are coming into it the first time and, and how we can steer you through. And, and um, uh, you know, Talis has already mentioned, we believe in making safety simple. Um, this isn't about as, as complicated and covering absolutely every eventuality off. It's about looking at your business, where the real risks are, and then communicating them to your team. Um, and developing a, a due diligence, a defence off the back of that. So, we'd be really happy to to have a chat if you if if you'd like, and we can talk through how we can support. That's very helpful. Um, we are building a new team, um, and building teams is is isn't straightforward if you're <laughs> if it's new to you in the first place. Absolutely, yeah. We, so, I, I, I know Shield will know us for supporting. We've got some, you know, some very, very large contracts. Um, you know, indeed the largest in the country, and we work with multiple site uh, operators, hotel groups, retailers, but equally we support single site operators as well. So um, mm-hmm. we have goods mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and products and an understanding right from the the single site operator up to, you know, a thousand plus units. So um, yeah, it'd be great to have a chat with you and see if we can help out. I'm used to SOPs. Uh, it, it means something to me. Yeah, uh, because it's, you, you, it's what you, you fall back on. Yeah, uh, and I'm really keen that we have a set of SOPs to Perfect. adhere 
adhere to in some format or another. So as you say, the format is key um, and we need to follow that up. Uh, absolutely. So within food safety, we talk about a food safety management system. We've got our food safety management system that's based on safe practices. So if you're comfortable mm. with our SOPs, you'll be very comfortable with our approach to safe, uh, safe methods, safe practices. Well, I've done my first safety management course <laughs> but I'm, I'm being told i need to upgrade and go yep. to the next level and the next level uh, well, so i need yeah. to find a beach and a pair of headphones and get on with it <laughs> well uh john if you want to um contact we'll come back. Oh, yeah yeah, yeah we'll, we'll we'll get in contact one way or another and um and let's see and we'll we'll make it simple for you thank you thank you very much guys uh, that was good okay anyone's got any more questions There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. So is that it then? There we go. Ellie, would you, should we wrap up? And we'll leave everyone to yeah. their Monday mornings. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you both for hosting this. It's been really informative. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Go safely. Bye, everyone. Bye.